Alrighty, so Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 through 25, and we've been going through uh, the book of Hebrews now, we've been going through several doctrinal uh, truths that have been revealed. Uh, Jesus Christ is superior in every way to the, to the Mosaic system, the Mosaic covenant, the law of Moses, and the sacrificial system. He is superior to the high priest that would offer the blood of bulls and goats. Uh, on Yom Kippur. He is superior to the offering of, of the blood of bulls and goats with offering his own blood, dying on a cross, his body broken for us, and his blood poured forth for our sins. It is the perfect sacrifice, and we're going to see we have boldness because of that sacrifice. Um, and, and so Jesus Christ uh, doesn't have an earthly sanctuary. He has the heavenly. He has ascended into the very presence of the Father, seated at the right hand of the Father, and He is our great high priest and intercessor. He is the perfect high priest with the perfect sacrifice, bringing us eternal redemption, eternal salvation. And all we have to do is simply receive it by faith. So this has been the, the, the case being made to a group of Jewish believers who are tempted to go back to the temple service to prevent persecution. They want to hold their peace, right? We talked about holding your peace or you keep your mouth shut in order to keep peace with people. They're being tempted to hold their peace and just go back and just go along to get along and offer the blood of bulls and goats again instead of resting in the finished and perfect work of their Messiah. So, so the case has been made now, and now we're going to transition to the practical application of these things in light of these doctrinal truths, these great truths that are enumerated in the first ten chapters of Hebrews. So as we shift now, we're going to be going uh, uh, more to a, 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 a practical application aspect now, uh, kind of a walk-related uh, uh, teaching as opposed to positional doctrinal truths which are foundational to our walk. So with that in mind, let's just look again at Hebrews uh, chapter 10, verse 19 through 25. I'm going to read it again, and then we're going to break it down verse by verse. Okay, so here we go. Verse 19 of chapter 10. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So this is the, the, the passage we're going to wrestle with over the next few weeks. And, and so let's look at this now, <clears throat> beginning with verse 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. So we get into this practical uh, application, and the first thing that leaps out at me here is we have boldness to do something, to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. And this, this phrase, boldness to enter into, is, is really a boldness of an entrance. We know of the entrance. We know of the entrance, the way now into the holiest. Because that's what he's been teaching all along here, particularly in chapters 8, 9, and 10. Uh, that Jesus Christ, through his broken body, and, and his body was, was typified in the tabernacle and the, the temple by what? By the veil that separated the most holy place and the holy place. And that veil was a picture of the body of Jesus Christ. In fact, the tapestry is woven with red and blue and scarlet thread. And that's a picture of the body, the bleeding and the bruising of the body of Christ. And remember when Jesus Christ gave up his spirit, 
There was a great earthquake, and the veil of the temple ripped from top to bottom all the way through. Now that veil was open, and it was picturing the access now that was opened up to all mankind, Jew and Gentile, can freely go in to the very presence of the holiest of all in the presence of God through the broken body of Jesus Christ. Now that veil has been rent and we can go into his presence. So we have boldness because we know the entrance into, the way to enter into the holiest is by the blood of Jesus Christ. You know, uh, one of the things I, I've been fascinated at as I, as I you know, uh, administer the YouTube channel to make videos and dialogue with people back and forth. One of the things that is very, very interesting is when I deal with someone who believes that you must work, you must keep the law, you must be a good Christian to be a saved Christian, that you must have a certain level of righteous behavior to go with your faith and, and you smush it together. And, and then God will accept you and you can be saved. When I talk to these people, you know the one thing that they lack is boldness. They have no boldness. They have no assurance whatsoever. Now the word boldness here, it, it's used back in Hebrews chapter 4, uh, it, kind of in a very similar context. The word boldness here means uh, frankness of speech. And, and when you... When, when, when I was thinking about this, when do people use very plain spoken words? It's when they're certain of something, right? When they have an assurance, they start becoming boastful and braggadocious about it, right? I, I thought about trash talking, you know, trash talking on a basketball court or whatever. A lot of times trash talking, they don't have a, they can't back it up, you know. But, but let's say that Michael Jordan was on your team. And let's say the Bulls were playing, you know, some scrub team like, you know, the Washington Bullets or whoever they might have been. That's what they were called at that time. Now it's not politically correct to call them that. But, but anyway, that's what they were at the time. You're like, dude, man, they're, Jordan, they're going to slaughter them, you know. And even then you could be wrong. The other team might actually win. But there's, you start to brag or speak freely when the facts are on your side, right? Mm -hmm. And you know you're going to win. We have a boldness today. We have a, a frankness of speech. Why? Why can we speak frankly about the entrance into the presence of God Almighty himself? Because Jesus Christ has secured it, and our boldness is not based on our works. You see, the moment you sprinkle works into your formula, the boldness and assurance collapses. Why? Because you begin to sin and sin and sin some more. But it says, we have, brethren, we having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. That is our confidence. It is not in our performance it is not in our church attendance. It is not, did we feel good today or did we feel bad today? You see, we get a lot of our direction and instruction from our feelings. We yield ourselves to our flesh and we're depressed and miserable and we don't know why. I have no boldness. I have no joy. And yet, I continue to feed my flesh. Huh, I wonder what the, what's going on here. As the church today walks according to the lusts of the flesh. That's why we are a lukewarm church. We're indistinguishable from the world. Because we're living after the flesh. We're chasing the American dream just like every other unbeliever. And we wonder why we have so many problems. Well, we have an assurance of boldness through the blood of Jesus Christ. That is our salvation. And that can never lose its power. That's why we can trash talk about heaven. And then by that, I just mean rejoicing in it. You see, one of the things that Lord shippers and do-gooders, the problem they have is they despise it when Christians have an assurance of their salvation. How dare you be so smug to say that you're going to heaven? I busted my ass over here serving God, and I don't know if I'm going. How can you be so glib? <laughs> Because I'm resting in something entirely different. The blood of Jesus Christ. Folks, when are we going to start thinking with faith instead of our freaking flesh? Are we, are we not tired of it yet? Are we not exhausted by the drama of the flesh? And then we think we can paper over our flesh with a prayer? 
Oh God, make it fit, get it fixed. I'm going to go back to living in the flesh, but fix it, Lord. Here's what I want, Lord. I want you to make my life happy while I live in the flesh. I want you to pave the way so I can live happily with no problems and indulge my flesh. And we think that that prayer somehow has power with God. We have boldness by the blood of Jesus Christ to enter into the presence of God. When this old sinful preacher, and I am sinful, and I'm as carnal as anyone else, but when I die, I'm going to heaven. I will be in glory. I will be glorified with the radiant glory of Jesus Christ himself because of the blood of Jesus Christ. It's that simple. Now, when you are talking about, we have having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus Christ, what are we describing here? We're describing worship. Because whenever the creature comes into the presence of the creator, that is a moment of worship. As I did a, a, a word search on the word worship, I shared this in a Bible study. Almost exclusively, there is the word they came or, or, you know, came unto him, as it relates particularly to Jesus, they came to him and worshipped. So there is a, a drawing together of a man with, in, in the presence of Jesus Christ and then worshipping him. Even in the instance when, remember, the devil's legion uh, had, had possessed this man, he was naked, he break chains, and everyone was terrified of this guy, and Jesus comes and casts the demons out of him. Even then, that man, demon-possessed, rushed to Jesus and fell down and worshipped him. So this is what happens, the natural reflexive action, when, when the creature gets into the presence of the Creator. Now this imagery that we're seeing here is, is looking at the Old Testament where the, the high priest would come into the presence of God. Okay, so now that he's been making the case now through Jesus Christ, there is an open entrance for all Jew and Gentile now to come in. You don't have to be the high priest on Yom Kippur now. Because we have Melchizedek, our great high priest, who has paved the way for us. Now we can go into the presence of God without fear. We can come boldly. Now it's a throne of grace to us. It's not a throne of judgment. It's a throne of grace. We come boldly now. We can speak plainly before God and just dump our concerns and our filth and our sin before him and say, Lord God, give me mercy and grace, and he will supply mercy and grace. So that's one aspect of worship in that sense that we're communing with God through prayer. But, I, but as I study this more, it's, it's that communion with God in his presence where we behold his glory and, and we meditate on him. Now, we're speaking about by faith right now, right? We don't see Christ. We're not going to get in a car and go somewhere. So, so you know, this is we're going to meet God here. You can't meet him here. you got to go here. But that's the way it was in the Old Testament, right? You had to go here. You had to get in the car or ride the donkey to get to Jerusalem three times a year. You had to go to meet God. And even then, you couldn't go into the Holy of Holies and worship God. But now we all have boldness. We Gentiles in Ogden, Utah, year 2022, we have boldness because of the blood of Jesus Christ and we right now are in the presence of God communing on his word. You know where you worship God? Right here. It's this book. This is how you're worshiping God. God is speaking and you open this book and you receive it in. I guess when you're not worshiping, when it's there, when it's on the shelf, when it's covered in dust, right? And it's, it's a mystery. Huh? It's a mystery. It's mysteries, right? <laughs> I can't figure this out. <laughs> no, we don't want to figure it out. That's the problem, right? Yeah. So, so let's look at this. I thought of John chapter 4, verse 21 through 24, where Jesus meets the, the woman at the well. She's a Samaritan. And uh, uh, they're talking a little bit about worship. And Jesus brings some real truth here to this dialogue. He says, Jesus said to her, Woman, uh, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. So I'll stop right here. The Samaritans... The Samaritans were the half-breeds. They were half-Jew, half-Gentile. The Jews despised them. When they rebuilt the second temple, the Jews refused to allow the Samaritans to assist in the building of the temple. <laughs> Therefore, the Samaritans said, okay, fine, we'll make our own temple on Mount Gerizim. And the ruins of that temple are still there to this day. You can see it up on that mountain. 
And the Samaritans still live in that region, right there around that mountain today. Um, so the, the woman at the well said, hey, I, I perceive you're a prophet. He was getting kind of close and touching some nerves about her lifestyle choices and stuff. <laughs> so he's like, uh, you know, let me ask you a religious question. Diversion here. Uh, some people say we should worship here. Others say in Jerusalem. What do you say? You seem like a prophet. So he says, there, the time is coming and now is where you're not going to worship either in this mountain or in Jerusalem. What do you mean? Moses commanded that the three times a year you would come and worship and, 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 and that the sacrifice is going on daily in the temple and, and Yom Kippur and, and the Day of Atonement. What do you mean? You, we're not going to go to Jerusalem to worship or here? What, what do you mean by that? So he says, um, uh, you won't go to, to this mountain or Jerusalem to worship the Father. He says to the Samaritan woman, you worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. So he's speaking to the Samaritan woman, saying, you think that you're worshiping God with your rituals, which are a mere counterfeit of what God actually prescribed. You're not worshiping God and what you do. You don't even know who you're worshiping. Your worshiping is, is vanity, because it's not prescribed by God. So he's just correcting her thinking here on this, and uh, he says, the hour coming is, is coming, and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. You see, that's why we don't get in a car and a plane and fly to Jerusalem to worship God at the temple. That's why we can meet in this old ramshackle place <laughs> and worship God. Now, the world views this as a, you can't worship in that. You need a nice building and, you know, some organ stuff going on there and all that. That's, that's some real worship going on there. No, worship in spirit and truth. Okay, And so worship is, that again, that moment, that reflexive moment when the creature responds to the presence of the Creator. And now Christ has granted us access into the Father through the Son, and we worship God in spirit and truth. And that occurs as we encounter God through the Scriptures. We commune with Him through the Word of God. We meditate, and by faith we perceive the truth of the nature of God. Just like we sang, great is thy faithfulness. Taken out of Lamentations chapter 3. Talks about the faithfulness of God. That's what that hymn is based off of, is that passage. Uh, Lamentations 3, 22 and 23. And, and so we are now singing and meditating about God. We have in spirit, not physically, in spirit... We are communing with God as we meditate on those truths and, and are coming to the presence of his person and character. Now, of course, the Spirit of God lives with, within us and reveals these truths to us through the Scriptures. But this is what it means to worship God in spirit and in truth. Well, to worship God in truth is to come by the only way possible, boldly through the entrance supplied by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's a true worshiper that comes to God by the means that God has prescribed through His Son, Jesus Christ, and His death, burial, and resurrection. And of course, to be very clear, Jesus Christ Himself is God in human flesh. Okay, He's not a creature that God made to be the Savior of the world. He is the second person of the triune God, the Logos, the Word made flesh, who dwelt among us for the very purpose of being the sacrifice for our sins <clears throat> and to fulfill the will of the Father accordingly. So we just, we just see this God as a spirit, and they that worship him must worship in spirit and truth. And as I was thinking about attributes and that reflexive response as we meditate on the nature of God, we marvel at the glory of God by faith, not with our eyes yet. It will be one day, it will be with our eyes, but right now it is by faith and the revelation of the word of God. And as we meditate on the character of God being in his presence by faith, through the blood of Jesus Christ, through the sacrifice of the Son of God on our behalf, then what is that response? Well, the first thing I thought of was thanksgiving. 
is a reflexive response to the character of God that God has extended graciously. Uh, what, what did the hymn say there? All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. See, Thanksgiving, we're coming up on Thanksgiving. You know, it bugs me when people call it Turkey Day. <laughs> it's Turkey Day. <laughs> We don't give thanks to God on that day and make a point of giving, being thankful. It's turkey day. We eat turkey. We don't ever eat turkey until this one day. No, it's Thanksgiving. It's, I mean, you know, we should be grateful every day. But, but a, a heart of gratitude is a reflection of worship. It's an expression of worship to give gratitude, thanksgiving to God. And, and by the way, the word thanksgiving in the Greek is, is, is very closely related, related to the word charis, which is grace. In fact, I believe it's the same word. It's just based on the context, you, you translate it as grace or you translate it as gratitude. Okay? And so thanksgiving is a response to the nature of God, which is gracious. What is grace? When God dispenses riches to us at no cost to us. And what are the riches he's dispensed? Well, he's created us. He sustains us physically. But the greater riches are the spiritual riches. And he's given us all, the Bible says he's given us all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I've said this before. I say it again. It is impossible for God to bless us any more than he has. You let that sink in. Almighty God, it's impossible for him to bless us any more than what he has done for us in Christ. The problem is these riches are spiritual riches. And because we are carnal people, we say, again, what's the cash value of righteousness? What's the cash value of imputation? What's the cash value of sanctification, of predestination, of foreknowledge, of faith? There is no cash value, and therefore it's useless to me. I'm a carnal man. I want... <laughs> I'm a material girl living in a material world. <laughs> okay? You know? Uh, so therefore, justification has no cash currency. I'm not interested in it until the chest pains come. Mm -hmm. Then it becomes the foremost thing in your mind. How do I get into the presence of God in a favorable way? Because I'm, I'm about to depart this world, and I didn't expect it today. It wasn't supposed to happen today. I had some other things on my day planner. Okay? So these things are spiritually discerned, and we commune with God in the Spirit as we, we, we come into His presence, meditating on His character, singing a hymn that glorifies Him, and we think about His character, reading the Scripture, and, and learning something of the nature of God, and, and, and then responding. So grace, response, worship is gratitude, thanksgiving to God. You know the ungrateful, who the ungrateful are? Those who, who think they're entitled to everything. Mm -hmm. You owe it to me. I'm not going to thank you for that. It's about time you gave it to me. <laughs> and, we, and the United States produces, is filled with the ingrate, and the entitled, right? Um, what is, is an expression of worship? Praise. What is praise? Praise is when you, you look at this this diamond, you know, with, with the magnifier, and you go, wow, this diamond, and then you start describing the attributes of it. So praise to God is an appraisal of his being. You're giving praise to God. You're ascribing his glory and say, what? these are your wow, 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 look at this great God that we serve. Again, what's the cash value to that? Nothing. Um, let's move on. Let's do something else. I don't want to do that. I want to praise God. In fact, anyone needs to be praised is me. Oh, that's narcissism, right? <laughs> that's narcissism. Me, 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 me. I want to talk about me. I want to talk about I. It's all about me. Praise me. It's never my fault. It's their fault. Me, I don't make mistakes. It's hard to worship God when you're narcissistic because you're, you praise yourself all the time. You're grateful to yourself. Um, unfortunately, believers can be that way. I mean, we, we, we walk in the flesh. You can be just like the world. Mm -hmm. Just like them. Miserable, nasty creatures who happen to be righteous, <laughs> justified creatures by faith in Jesus Christ. 
uh, to marvel at God, to marvel. Think about marvelous things, to marvel. You know, I've gotten, you know, since we've, uh, we've come to uh, accept a biblical uh, uh, explanation of the cosmology, I mean, I take my camera out and look at some of these stars and planets and film the sun setting and the moon in an eclipse. I marvel at that stuff. Man. When I was when I filmed that uh, that lunar eclipse back in May, <laughs> and I need some thicker glasses. I'm zoomed in, and all these guys are up there on the mountain. They got their cameras, and they're all experts. And I'm the boo, you know knocking my camera, almost knocking it over and fumbling around. And I zoomed in at total totality and the moon was blood red. And I could see stars in the distance. I mean, it took my breath away. I marveled at what I was looking at. And that is the creation of God. There's a God who made that and I know him. Mm -hmm. I know that guy. I don't even want to say that guy. He's a, he's a man. I know Jesus Christ who spoke and created those stars. And now I'm marveling at the beauty of what he is doing before my eyes. And I'm capturing it on film. So it's an expression of worship when you marvel over the character of God. Our problem is we don't meditate on him. What do you think about? What do you think about? You want to know if you're carnally minded? Here's the test. I don't think about Jesus. That's carnally minded. Mm -hmm. I do not think about Jesus. That's, that's pretty hard hitting. It's very clear. I think about science. I think about this. I think about that. I think about all these things, but I do not allow my mind to meditate on the person of Jesus Christ. Well, guess what? You're not worshiping him. Mm -hmm. right? You're walking carnally. There's a scripture we're going to get to in, in Romans uh, 8, 5. I'm going to read it now because we're going to kind of get into these now. Romans 8, 5, and 6, uh, Paul writes, he says, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Now, this is not speaking of a physical death. Obviously, it can't be physical death because once you die, you can't be carnally minded. <laughs> We're talking about someone who is physically alive, a believer who is physically alive, has spiritual life as well, but they are minding the things of the flesh. Now, that means that their mind is consumed and occupied with the thoughts of carnality. It's all about this. It's all about this. And that is death. That is a state of death. Well, what's the contrast? Well, life and peace. Life and peace. If you're spiritually minded, you have life and peace. Your circumstances could be horrifying, but you will abide in life and peace, carnal, or you're spiritually minded. When I thought about death and was meditating on that, what does it really look like for a carnally-minded person to be, uh, and, and, and the fruit of this is always death, to be carnally-minded is death. Um, death is separation, right? Fundamentally, the word death means separation, okay? So physical death is when your spirit separates from your body. Spiritual death is when your spirit is separated from God. You cast the lake of fire. That's the second death. It's eternal death, irreversible death. What does it mean to be carnally minded? To be carnally minded is death. Well, death, as I think about that, death equals drama. Drama. Don't you just love drama? Drama, drama, drama. Everything is drama. Everything's a crisis. Everything's a conflict. Drama equals conflict, war, enmity. Just churning, seething conflict is death. Everything involved is the stench of death. And it's like, this is, uh, I can't stand drama. Mm -hmm. I, I flee from it. 
drama. And doesn't that characterize the world today? The world is characterized by drama. Not stability, but drama, conflict, brokenness, crisis, lurching from crisis to crisis to crisis to crisis. It's the life of, of a world of people that are in the flesh. And this is their operating system. This is the unbelieving. This is the only operating system the unbeliever has is to operate in the flesh. So everything they do, they touch, turns into drama. Okay? The believer, we have a choice. But because we, we're, it's the age of Laodicea and we're in the United States and, you know, everything, you know. So we can be carnal and not have that consequence. Wrong. If you live in the flesh, you will experience this type of death, a separation from the Spirit of God, which life brings life and peace. Everyone and every <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I was just checking to see Stephen on the floor. Okay. <laughs> I thought you were doing some online shopping while I was preaching about <laughs> <this carnality. laughs> Well, that sale ends in five minutes. <laughs> that doesn't Never walk Black Friday. Right. <laughs> We're very spiritual people. <laughs> Do not laugh at that. <laughs> I will edit this from the video. <laughs> Too late. Oh dear. Um, but but the drama and, and, and look at look at this look at this think about this the carnality. we Jan and I were talking about this uh, this morning about you know couples don't marry anymore right they live together. Mm -hmm. live together. Mm -hmm. Well, why do, they, why do they live together? Because we want the easiest out possible. I'm not committed to you long term. Mm -hmm. I'm committed until things turn south or I find a better deal. Mm -hmm. And I want to make the departure as easy as possible. Because mm -hmm. once you get married, you've got complications and ties that tie you together, and it's very difficult to cut through all that to, to be separated. It's very painful. But if we always keep in the back of our mind that we can leave at any time, mm -hmm. Uh, then it makes it easier. And we're not dependent upon each other. And so what happens? You have no commitment, right? And so you have children born into this situation. Mm -hmm. Because the flesh, you know, that's, that's why they get together, is, is, the, is the sexual intimacy, right? That's why they stay together. That's why they came together and lived together. It makes it very easy for this intimacy when we live in the same house, and that's what we want. Uh, and then a child is born into that, and then the inevitable happens, the separation. And now you've got a child without a father. And the drama that comes with that, the death of the family, that family is dead, it's destroyed. And now that, that person is never going to go on and find other people to cohabitate with, maybe marry another person or maybe not, maybe cohabitate because, you know, who knows how relationships go. My relationship didn't work, so I don't want to marry someone else. I mean, their whole thinking is skewed. Why would a woman ever cohabitate with a man? Why would she do that? It's the most foolish thing, you know? And, and yet they do it, and, and then they're surprised when mm -hmm. there's infidelity. They're surprised when it didn't work out, and now, you know, it's, it's destroyed. But this is the fruit, this is the drama, and this is, this is the leave it to beaver family is not the, the norm anymore. Mm -hmm. It's the broken third, fourth, fifth relationship. Baby mama, one, two, three fathers. Three children, three fathers, living according to the state on welfare, cohabitating with her fourth uh, lover. Mm -hmm. This is living over the flesh. And so everything is drama. And now all these relationships now are still have tentacles into the lives of these children and this woman. You cannot ever fully escape that. Mm -hmm. And it's drama, drama, death, 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 misery. Because you walk in the flesh. And brothers, I mean, you know, this, if we walk in the flesh, we are not exempt from the exact same death that this mm -hmm. scripture is describing here. But now notice this, to mind the things of the Spirit, this is what I'm talking about, actual worship. Mind the things of the Spirit. You see, this is, this is the part where we, we, we make a, a, a choice to say, I'm going to get acquainted with my God. I'm going to commune with my God. I, I shared the story last night, uh, you know, Saturday in, in, in football season is tough for me because Oklahoma is playing. I, I, I need to be in my office studying and prepping and putting the sermon together. But 
It's fourth down in Oklahoma. Is it to, <laughs> it's fourth and goal with 30 seconds left. And so I, I, I make a choice, right? I make a choice. And so it is with, with the Word of God. We've, we've got to make a choice here. Do we believe this is the Word of God? Do we believe it has the solutions? Or we just think it's a book that gets us to heaven and makes us feel good on Sunday? God is faithful. Do we really believe great is thy faithfulness? Or is it like, yeah, it's a nice song that makes you feel good. But he can't be trusted with my life. I can't trust him on that. Oh, he orders the sun, moon, and stars. And, <laughs> but I can't trust him with my life, his word for me. This is how we commune with God. This is how we enter into his presence, meditating and communing with him. Right? It's not by going to church. You could be at church right now and not... And not be engaged. You'd be like checked out spiritually. I'm, I'm physically here. I'm not spiritually here. Spiritually, I'm over here at the sale that's going to end in 30 seconds if I don't punch these buttons. Which Jana wasn't doing. <laughs> Let the viewer know that wasn't what she was doing. So, so where, where's our spirit in our communion with God? Again, what do you think about? If you don't think about Jesus, you're walking in carnality. Your thoughts are carnal. I'm not saying they're pornographic thoughts, but they're carnal thoughts and they'll end in death. Now, now, so the decay rate is different for different people, but the end of this walking in carnality is death. It'll bring death to everything that is influenced by your carnal mind. Okay. Now, Ephesians 3, 17 through 19, we're going to just get through these few verses here. Ephesians and then 2 Corinthians 3, 18. Ephesians 3, 17 through 19, I thought this was a really good verse that, that helps us to understand to come boldly into the presence or to the holiest. And really, all this, the, the title of this sermon is Let Us Draw Near, which really we don't find that passage until verse 22. Let us draw near. He's building up to this. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. But that's in verse 22, so you have to come back next week to at least get to that. But this is what we're drawing, talking about. What does it look like to come boldly and enter into the holiest or draw near to the presence of God in our spirit? What does it look like today to do that by the blood of Jesus? And what's the benefit? My, you know, I was thinking of what drove me on this was, so what? Why would I want to draw near? Mm. Why would I want that? And I realized as I was asking the question, my flesh is asking that question. Why would the flesh ever want to have anything to do with Jesus Christ? I don't even think about him. I'm not interested in him. What's the cash value of drawing near? Why? Will I have a promise of, of health? Will my, will, it, will my back feel better? Will, it, will my relationships clear up? What, what's the cash value here? So, eternal life is a big part of it. <laughs> but, but again, the Christian says, well, you know, I've already got eternal life. I believe the gospel. So I have eternal life. So now why should I expend effort to come into his presence and draw near? Why? So, Ephesians 3, 17 uh, through 19. And, and I'm just to summarize the reason is because God has a meta-narrative for our lives, right? It started in eternity past with God's foreknowledge, election, and predestination. And it goes into eternity future with our glorification becoming the fullness, being filled with the fullness of God himself. Okay, this is indescribable compared to the trinkets and the, and the vanities of this life, right? To be filled with the fullness of God himself, to share in his glory. We can't, these things don't even register because we don't even think about them, right? We think about, I got to do this, and I got to do the hustle, and I got to do this, and this, and this, and this. Oh, I'm going to do that, and I'm going to watch this, and all this stuff. So three, uh, Ephesians 3, 17 through 19, it says that Christ, this is the prayer of Paul, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Now, when Christ is dwelling in your heart by faith, this is not synonymous with being sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, okay? I like to compare it to, this is the best imagery I can come up with to make, make this plain. 
when you're born again, when you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, and the Holy Spirit of God makes residence, eternal residence in your spirit, it's like the pilot light poof, has been lit. The pilot light is on and never goes out, okay? The life of the Spirit of God is always inside of us. That, that down, uh, down payment, the uh, uh, future glory, and the dwell, indwelling of the presence of the Holy Spirit. But if you've ever, you know, it's winter time now, so you, you kick that heat up a little bit. It gets cold in the house, 25 outside, mm -hmm. so I want it to be like 75 in the house, and you bump that up. Dude. And the gas is added to that pilot light, and you can hear it in the furnace. That is the Holy Spirit residing in you and then Christ in your heart by faith. You see, when Christ is dwelling in your heart by faith, you have the mind of Christ operating in your spirit. And you begin to view things through the mind of Christ and not from the carnal mind. And so your, your, everything that was up now becomes down, and what was down becomes up. Your value system is radically transformed. Okay, When Christ is dwelling in your heart by faith, by faith, by faith, not by doing, but by faith. Again, by the hearing of faith, reading the Word of God, and by faith, Christ is now abiding in your heart by faith, not by your actions, okay? That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, that's our position, folks, that's who we are. We are rooted and grounded in love. And we don't even care. whoop de do. What's the cash value of that verse, Ron? Really, seriously. Okay? Um... Well, this is great value, tremendous <laughs> eternal value, being rooted and grounded in love, that we may be able to comprehend with all saints. Notice that this is the mind of the Spirit, folks. Listen to this. That we might be able to comprehend with all the saints, everyone who, is, who has been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, past, present, and future, with all the saints, what is the breadth, the length, the depth, and the height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. You see, this is why right now, right here in this life, we need to draw near to the presence of God through faith. Is that we might be filled with the fullness of God now. And so that death we were talking about that comes with the carnal mind... That's not our experience. Oh, our circumstances stink. And if our, if our uh, joy was based on our circumstances, we would be miserable people. I'm not saying our circumstances clear up. What I'm saying is that, that Christ resides in us and there is a new spirit of, of love and joy that permeates despite the circumstance because our eyes by faith are not looking at the circumstance. We're looking up to the love of God in Christ Jesus. And oh, by the way, we're seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. And we're looking down on our circumstances from the lofty vantage point of victory. The carnal mind views it the other way around. We're down in the, the muck and the mire from our position, our own strength, right? And it's, it's hopeless. It's hopeless from the flesh fleshly perspective. So we see that we are to, to, to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge. See, this is the thing, is, and this, is, this comes from my own heart. Uh, years ago I said, Lord, I just don't feel your love. Lord, show me your love. And so first of all, the problem was, was looking for the love of God through my feelings, right? Mm -hmm. Okay? So, so then I started a study. I started a word study on the word love. All, everywhere is used in the Bible. And I saw a picture develop. And, and to summarize it, the love of God is not expressed in your circumstances. The love of a God is expressed at Calvary. And when you begin to unpack Calvary and that what God has done for us in Jesus Christ, and that Jesus Christ would go through with this horrendous suffering and death and, and, and burial at the hand of his enemies, to be isolated, separated from the Father, in the sense of now being the recipient of the wrath of the Father, where they had had this perfect eternal relationship of love. Now he is separated, having become the sin bearer for all humanity, and the wrath of God being poured out to crush the Son of God. Why would he do that? For us. 
with all of our baggage and nye, 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 ba, 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 <laughs> ingratitude, unthankfulness, carnal thinking, and Christ still died for us to know. See, we got to think about this stuff, folks. We're thinking about it now. It's like, oh, okay, I kind of see a little bit of what you're saying. But as soon as this guy quits yapping, I'm going to quit thinking about this and start thinking about the world again and my fleshly desires and goals. And so, so we will be filled with the fullness of God. And if that doesn't, like, eh, I don't care if I'm filled with the fullness of God. <laughs> Think about it. Everything you're pursuing in this world is to imitate what you receive. You get the filled with the fullness of God. I'm pursuing, I'm trying to get happy, Ron. I'm trying to be happy in life. Can I have some happiness? Yeah, you're, but you're pursuing it the wrong way. You're never, you're going to get death if you keep going this way. It's like I say, well, how's that working out so far? How's that worked out for you so far? Pursuing your own carnal appetites. Right? To be filled with the fullness of God, to have peace and joy and wisdom, to know the presence of God, to, to walk in the presence of God, to commune with God, not just an occasional Sunday, but to commune with God on a constant, but to, to think about Jesus. Eureka! Eureka! To think about Jesus. <laughs> what... Uh, anyway, I, I could go on a rant here, but I'm, I've, I've been ranting all afternoon. So that you might be filled with the fullness of God. That's what God. That's why He wants us to come into His presence. And think about that. That's what God's eternal desire for mud man is. We're just mud man. He wants to take mud man and fill mud man with the fullness of Himself as creatures made of mud. That is his desire for us. And we're like, no, nah, thanks, no thanks. I can get it down here doing this. I got a hustle going on. It's going to make it pay off, man. <laughs> uh. <laughs> you know? So let's, let's okay, gotta, the beeper went off. Let's close on this. 2 Corinthians 3.18, because this really, mm, I, I posted on this this morning. And this was a really powerful passage here. And it's, it's coming off the, the, uh, the, the narrative of, of Moses. He, he wanted to see the glory of God. He wanted to be to see the glory of God, which what requires nearness, right? God said, no, you, you, can, you can't look at my glory and live. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk by you. And, and the hinder parts, you can look on my hinder parts as I pass by. And I'm going to put you in this rock, the cleft of this rock. Okay, and so you won't die. You're in the cleft of the rock. Didn't we just sing about that? Mm -hmm. he, he, he hides us in the cleft of the rock, right? And so I'll pass by. And so the, the glory of God got on the face of Moses. And he came down to the people from Mount Sinai. He had this glory on his face, but that glory was fading. It, would fa it was fading out. So he put a veil on his face so people, first of all, wouldn't be terrified of him. But secondly, <laughs> so they wouldn't see that that glory was fading out. And that was a picture, is a picture that, <clears throat> that the glorious ministry of from Mount Sinai with all the thunderings and lightnings and the voice and trumpet sound and all this stuff, that's temporary. And it, was, it served a purpose of revealing that we were sinful, we needed a Messiah. And, and so we look forward to, so that has faded away and now we have the new covenant with Jesus Christ, right? So now though, uh, so this is the context of 2 Corinthians 3, 18. And so now Paul picks up, he says, but we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass or as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord, we are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Now this is a snapshot of what it means and the benefits of coming into the presence of, of God, to draw near by faith. And again, this isn't some lotus thing, hum, come on God, hum, hum, I didn't get nothing. Or you might get something, you might get a spirit that will answer that sort of nonsense. 
and say it's Jesus Christ or an angel or whatever. <laughs> I'm talking about simply reading the book and believing it. That's what I'm talking about. So, so what, what, is ha what happens in this, in this meditation? First of all, we all with open face, unlike Moses, our face is open. Okay? And the face of Jesus Christ is open to behold. Right? There's no veil over his face except to the unbeliever. We're talking about believers here. All right? We all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord. Now, this is embarrassing, and it shows my vanity and carnality. Uh, as I've gotten older, the hair starts to thin, right? <laughs> so I become sensitive to that. So I kind of let it grow out long, and I comb it back here. <laughs> well, bef before all this frou-frou stuff and putting, you know, the gel in it so it'll hold it so I'm not as balding, you know, it's not as apparent. Before that, I would get out of the shower, get dressed, go. I wouldn't even, you know, look at myself. Like, well. But now I'm like... <laughs> <laughs> I look at every little whisker on my face. Like, oh, that one's kind of sticking out. <laughs> Get the razor. <laughs> and that's pathetic. I, I become like a woman. <laughs> standing in there. <laughs> Jan's like, are you going to get out of the bathroom? <laughs> 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 but what I, what I thought of that was, I'm meticulously looking at myself in the mirror. Whisker. <laughs> that's how we're to meditate on Christ mm. Mm. that's how we meditate on Christ this is what God's calling us to do like a man looking at his face in a mirror look and gaze at Christ and marvel over him how do we do that? we open this book by faith and we read it read John chapter 17 meditate on John 17 what Jesus Christ has prayed for us who we are it's beautiful the future is really great for us okay Basically, we're going to be one with God all the time. All the time. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean just we're hanging out all the time. I mean we're going to share in His essence mm -hmm. as mud man. We can't even fathom that. That's what we need to look at in the mirror. Start fathoming it. It will change your perspective on everything that you're enduring and, and going through in life. So He says, We with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image. Now I put this in, in the text, if you can see this. The word here is metamorpho. It's, it's where we get the word metamorphosis, etc. The byproduct of gazing at Jesus Christ is that we become transformed through that process. We are transformed into the likeness of Christ. Not by law keeping, not by pledging to be better, but by the meditation of faith on the person of Jesus Christ. That means we open this book and we read it and we meditate on it. That's what we have to do. That is the spiritual discipline. And I tell you now, now right now, the flesh will do anything but read that book. It will say prayers. Oh, the religious people, they love to pray. They pray, pray, pray. Pray is a substitute. Right? I, I'll tell God my will. I won't read his will. I'll tell him my will. <laughs> In prayer. I'm spiritual now. No, the transformation comes as we consume this book and gaze at Jesus Christ, the face of Christ, meditating on his love and knowing, and Christ now becomes formed in us as that pilot light flames up inside with a passion for Christ. And in that process, we become transformed. And so the Greek here, first of all, it's in the present tense for the word change or metamorpho. Meta metamorpho, actually, metamorpho. Number one is present tense. That means it's always happening in the background. Mm -hmm. It's always happening in the background. The next thing you know, you go out and look at that plant. You planted it two weeks ago, and you look at it. Hey, hey, there's the sprout. Look at that. Look at that. It's a sprout now. But that growth was going on the whole time from the time you planted it and watered it till that moment that it sprouted up. So that the metamorphosis is present tense, always happening. Number two, it's passive. That means we're not the ones doing it. We're being acted upon. God is doing the work in us, not us saying, okay, I, I got short with the kids today. I need to really knuckle down and not be so mean with the kids. <laughs> That's not how it works. And oh, by the way, if you operate in that, guess what? You're going to be twice as mean to the kids. <laughs> Take it from me. Yeah. 
need to stop that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I really need to stop that. <laughs> 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 it's hard being a dad. It's hard being a carnal dad. <laughs> Unfortunately, I think we were all raised by carnal dads. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so my dad's fault. Uh, I'm just like my dad. It's his fault. <laughs> well, who does he blame? <laughs> um, so we are changed. It's passive. God does a work on us. See how grace works? We're the passive recipients of this transformative work. You say, oh, I could never be like so and so. That's right. You could never be like that. But you can look at Christ and he can make you like that. He can transform your desires. Change them. Overcome the bad and give you power to walk in, in newness of life. And then finally, uh, it is indicative. It is present tense, it's passive, and it is indicative. In other words, it's just a statement of fact. It's just indicating a statement of fact. It's not an imperative. An imperative is a command. It's imperative that you do this. You do this. It's imperative. That's a command. No, this is indicative. I'm just telling you what will happen if you'll look at Jesus Christ. If you'll actually think about it. If you'll actually think about Him. Okay? I'm not saying that you have to be a monk. Okay? And just read the Bible all, the day, all day long. I'm not saying that. That's not what I'm saying. I don't read the Bible all day, and I don't think about Jesus all day. But I will say this, that He is running that in my conscious mind... Pretty frequently. Pretty frequently. Now, could it be more? Absolutely. Could be more. Case in point. Uh, still some transformation going on there. But we're changed. We're changed. Present tense is happening now. It's passive. God's doing the work on us, and it's indicative. I'm just telling you how it works. You just open face, behold in the glass, looking at Jesus Christ, the glory of Christ. His weightiness, his substance, his character, and you're going to be changed into his likeness. It's very, very uh, compatible with that you might be filled with the fullness of God. These are synonyms because if, if you're getting Christ into you, you're, you're getting God into you. You're forming Christ. Christ is being formed in you, and that translates out into the fingertips and the tongue and the ears and the eyes and everything, the walk mm -hmm. of the feet. Everything is, is affected by that formation, and it's without our effort. Just uh, there's a, a German brother who's in our group, and he shared something the other day when he got saved, and all these sins boop, 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 just sloughed off. He's like, I found these things distasteful, <laughs> disgusting, yeah. and I couldn't bear them anymore. That that's now now look obviously uh, that's not always the case with every believer that the experience that they have the moment they come to faith is different. For me, I was able uh, God just. Uh, God took away desire or the, or the constant profanity. I constantly was profane. And God took that away. <clears throat> My children brought it back. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> I've got to edit this video. Um, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, but God's just showing me some deeper issues, you know, <laughs> using, using uh, human beings to draw these things out. But what happens is we're changed from the glory of Christ, now we're getting glory. We're receiving that glory from glory to glory, His glory to us, and this constant process of being. I look at Him, and He He instills Himself into me. I look at Him, more of Him is instilled in me, and my carnal mind slowly becomes a spiritual mind where I am mindful. Not that I let everything go. You know the saying: He's so heavenly minded, He's no earthly good. No, that's a, that's a religious monk. That's a religious monk who climbs up a cliff and lives and poops in a cave until he dies. That's not the Christian life. Because if you're heavenly minded, you are the salt of the earth. You are valuable on this planet. And people find worth and value in your life as you yield yourself. You're no longer a narcissist. You actually think of others first. Hey, how about that? A human being that thinks of other human beings before he thinks of himself. It's possible as we grow in the grace of Jesus Christ. And this is, 
we come full circle, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. He is the entrance into eternal glory through his death, burial, and resurrection on our behalf. Let's pray.